So Pauline, you are on mute. Good morning. My name is Pauline de Godanzi. I am CMO of Choose Paris Region. Uh, let me give a very warm welcome to our attendees this morning for our webinar on the first steps to start a business in France and Paris Region. It all started through the collaboration between NLBC and Choose Paris Region. Our organization share the same objective, and it is to uh, support Dutch SMEs to uh, set up their business in Paris Region and to develop their activities and ecosystem in France. First of all, a few words on uh, Choose Paris Region. We are a one-stop shop for international companies and talents. Each year, we support around 1,200 international companies and their staff, hand in hand with uh, local players and uh, authorities. We uh, provide companies with advice and uh, services uh, they need to uh, expand and thrive in our region. Our services are tailor-made, they are free of charge, they cover a broad range of topics uh, such as understanding the French market, getting insights on our market, getting connections, um, finding clients, and uh, um, also uh, support to uh, employee and staff relocation in, the, in France and Paris region. We recently published a guide, a handbook for international companies on today's topic first steps to start a business in France and Paris region. Villemay, maybe a few words on the uh, NLBC? Thank you, Pauline. Uh, my name is Willemijn Beerenschot. I'm founding mem uh, board member of the Netherlands Business Council of France. Um, I'm honored to welcome you also on behalf of our business director, Anouk Zouk, and the whole team to this webinar commissioned by the Embassy of the Netherlands in France. Today's webinar is about how to set up your business in France. We have chosen this topic because setting up a business in France is not that easy. Research shows that entrepreneurs may face several challenges um, when they are on their customer journey towards France, and especially during the starting phase and the operational phase. NLBC assists such Dutch small and medium enterprises uh, with uh, information, assistance and support services. Through our network of qualified service providers, we are able to link our members to trustworthy um, advisors and our peer-to-peer -peer network enables executives as well to share their experiences and to find the right partners. Currently, there are more than 2,400 companies, Dutch companies in France, and there will be more. With this web webinar, we want to inform you, Dutch Nederlandse MKB'er, about all the possibilities of setting up your business in France. We have been there, we've done that, and you shall succeed as well. Um, law firm Amstel Sena shall uh, explain us today um, uh, uh, some key legal aspects about how to set up your business in France, and they will uh, talk about employment law issues. Subsequently, the successful Dutch company Ibusco shall describe how to set up, how they set up their company in France. And finally, Choose Paris Region shall discuss um, recruitment in the Paris region, and they will tell us also some uh, aspects about fiscal uh, incentives that uh, may make business life here in France much easier. Before we get started, I would like to inform you that today's presentation will be uploaded on our website. And in, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to put them into the chat. There will be a Q&A at the end of the session. So, allow me now to introduce you um, two partners of the law firm Amstel Sena. It's a firm that specializes, sorry, 
it's a firm that specializes uh, in international business law with a focus on commercial exchanges between the Benelux and France. The first speaker is Grietje van der Wiel, who specializes in company law, mergers and acquisitions, and partnerships agreements. The second speaker is Miriam Berg, and she is specialized in employment and company law. Both are French lawyer, lawyers with a native knowledge of the Dutch language and culture. Grietje, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Willemijn. Um, and good morning to everybody. It's good to be with you today. I will try in a quite short time to give you a good overview of the main questions one should ask himself from a corporate law point of view when starting a business in France. When starting an autonomous activity through an independent and permanent establishment in France, it is compulsory to register in France. And basically, one has two options for that. Either it is possible to register a branch or it is possible to register a subsidiary. A branch, contrary to a subsidiary, does not have a legal existence which is separate or distinct from the foreign company that establishes it. So it is an establishment that will operate autonomously it will have a local representative with sufficient powers to enter into relationships with third parties and to carry out the business. But from a legal point of view, in the end, the acts that are performed on behalf of the branch will be considered to have been performed in the name and on behalf of the foreign company that established it. As there is no distant legal entity, there are certain questions uh, which will have to be asked when incorporating a company, which will not be raised when registering a branch, such as the initial capital funding, because a branch does not need own equity, such as the number of shareholders, because there are no shareholders in the branch, such as the way the collective decisions will be taken, because it will remain decisions at the level of the foreign company such as the way shares will be transferred because there are no shares in a branch. So the registration process and operation may be lighter for a branch, but it should be kept in mind that this is not a separate entity and it does therefore also not have its own assets and liabilities. It is not distinct from the foreign company that established it. The other option is registering a company which has its own legal personality. The most usual forms of companies in France are the SARL, which is a company in which the relations between the shareholders are very important and it's therefore well adapted to small family-like businesses. Then there is the SA, the Société Anonyme, which is more adapted for large companies and also for companies that want to be listed on the stock exchange. Then you have the SAS. For the SAS, there is not a strict legal framework as is the case for the SARL and the SA. So it offers a flexibility that can also be very useful. And last, there are, is the SEI, but it's a civil company which is quite specific and which is used mainly for real estate operations. When opting for a certain form of company, there are some main questions that will have to be asked. First, what is the minimum share capital? In an SARL, an SAS and an SEI, there is no minimum share capital. Only in the SA, there is a minimum required share capital of 37,000 euro. Second, what is the number of shareholders? An SAS and an SARL can be established with only one shareholder, whereas in the SA and in the SEI, at least two shareholders will be required. What is the liability of the shareholders? In the SARL, the SA and the SAS, which are limited commercial companies, the liability of the shareholders is in principle limited to their initial capital contributions. In the SCI, the liability of the shareholders is unlimited. 
what are the management bodies? Will there be only one sole legal representative, which is the case in an SAS and can be the case in an SARL and an SEI, or will there be a collective management body? Can the legal representative be a legal entity, so another company, or must it necessarily be an individual? That is the case in the SRL, for instance. If it is an individual, can he have an employment contract? Will he be remunerated? What will be his legal status, his tax status, his social security status? Those items vary from one form of company to the other. What are the decision-taking rules? Is a physical meeting required every time the shareholders take a decision? Or can the shareholders' decisions be taken in writing? There has been some more flexibility during the last month due to the sanitary crisis. But globally, in an SA and an SARL, the rules are stricter and physical meetings are more often required than is the case in an SAS where basically all the decisions can be taken in writing without physical meeting. And last but not least, what are the share transfer rules? In the SCI and the SARL, where the relations between the shareholders are very important, the prior approval of the transfer of shares to a third party is always required. And another important thing, the shareholders are indicated in the Articles of Association which means that any third party can request the articles of association with the trade registry and know who the shareholders are. And another important thing, every time the shares are transferred, the articles of associations will have to be amended. This is not the case in the SA and the SAS, where the shares are freely negotiable and they can be transferred via a mere share transfer form. I don't want to go too much into tax details, but the registration duties on share transfers are also an important aspect. When transferring shares of an SCI, a 5% registration duty will be levied by the tax authorities. When transferring shares of an SARL, the registration duties amount to 3% after a 23,000 euro deduction when 100% of the shares are transferred. When transferring shares of an SA or an SAS, only a 0.1% registration duty will be levied. Now, once the form of the company has been chosen and all those questions have been answered, what are the main registration steps? First of all is, of course, that it's necessary to draft the Articles of Association. The Articles of Association will reflect the main characteristics of the company. So in particular, all the questions I have just mentioned, but also other important things, such as the corporate name, which must be carefully chosen, and the corporate purpose. It is very important to provide a clear description of the corporate activities. This is important in particular because it may also be an indication for the collective labor agreement that will be applicable, but also because certain activities are regulated. This is, for instance, the case for insurance activities, banking and finance activities, activities in the medical sector, but also transportation activities, which may require specific authorizations. Then there are two things which are very important before being able to register the company. The company has to choose a head office because at the moment of the registration with the trade registry, it has to provide evidence of its title to the premises, which can be either an ownership title or a lease agreement or a domiciliation agreement. When the company does not need in the beginning actual premises to exercise and carry out its activity, it can have recourse to domiciliation services, which are provided by certain specialized companies, not law firms in general, but there are specialized companies who do that. And they can provide just an office space or even just a post box. Another very important thing is that the amount of the share capital 
must be deposited on a French bank account prior to the signing of the Articles of Association, and this even if the capital is very low. I must draw your attention to the fact that the key KYC process, the Know Your Customer process of banks, but even of domiciliation companies, tends to become more and more severe and strict and complex. So this is something that can take some time. There is a possibility um, for lawyers to open a specific bank account with the local low, uh, lawyers uh, fund, which makes things faster. But in the end, a company is always obliged to have a French bank account. So it can accelerate things upon a corporation, but the opening of a French bank account will also remain something that is necessary. Then we already discussed about the necessity to appoint legal representatives. There can also be the question of the appointment of the legal of the statutory auditors. The thresholds that are set by French law for the appointment of a statutory auditor are quite high and in principle they will not be reached at incorporation. But of course it is possible to appoint a statutory auditor on a voluntary base. And maybe this can also be a group requirement when the French company belongs to a group which has statutory auditors. When a statutory auditor is appointed, this is generally for a six-year period, and it's important to note that it's not possible to terminate this mandate earlier. When you appoint a statutory auditor, it's for six years, and it's not possible to put an end to his mandate earlier. Then, last but not least, there is the obligation to declare the ultimate beneficial owner of the company. This is an obligation throughout Europe, so also in France. And since last year, the information that is disclosed with respect to the ultimate beneficial owner is accessible to any third party. Basically, the ultimate beneficial owner is the individual that holds directly or indirectly more than 25% of the shares of the French company or that, in fact, controls the French company. When there is no individual holding more than 25% of the shares directly in, or indirectly, then it will be the legal representative of the French company that will be designated as ultimate beneficial owner. The declaration of the ultimate beneficial owner must be made upon incorporation, but during the lifetime of the company, it will have to be filed any time there is a change in the share capital, the organization of the decision taking or the management of the company. There are other recurring annual corporate obligations for French companies. First thing is that it's necessary to hold certain corporate registers and in particular the shareholder registry in which all the shareholders decisions must be kept and which should be regularly updated. Then every year, a French company must approve its financial year accounts. And at this occasion, decide upon the allocation of its results, the profit or loss. And in the case the net equity becomes lower than half of the share capital, there must be a formal decision of the shareholders to continue the activity and not to wind up the company. And there is also a re recapitalization obligation within two years. The corporate accounts must all also be filed with the trade registry and are then accessible to third parties. Although for small companies, there are certain confidentiality options. It is very important to do things right from the beginning because our experience is that when things are not regularly done at the beginning, when the company starts to grow, when it contemplates to join with other shareholders, to do some capital raising or to restructure its uh, organization, then it's difficult to regularize things afterwards. And I will now hand over to Miriam 
because certainly there are also some very important labor law aspects. Thank you, Grietje. Um, good morning to everybody. Well, I uh, would like to point out some main differences between French labor law and Dutch labor law. Dutch labor law and French labor law, in fact, have uh, reflect as any law the mentality of the land, the, the country they are coming from. Therefore, in France, you have to be sure that you know all the rules. There are many rules in France, but if you abide by those rules, it may have a very good positive effect on you and on the employees. Talking about labor law in France can take about 10 hours or it can take, as in this case, only five minutes. So please forgive me if I'm a bit quick and short on some important points. If you have further questions, this can be done in the chat later at the end of this session. First important difference with the Netherlands. In France, there are always collective bargaining agreements that apply as most of them have de been extended by government's decision, uh, like Algemeen Bindet verklaard in the Netherlands. So even if you and your employees are no member of what, uh, what organization whatsoever, there will be a collective labor agreement. And in that labor agreement are a certain number of rules, for example, about extended trial periods or dismissal premiums or things like that. Other important difference in the Netherlands, very often, the first contract that is offered to an employee is a contract for a certain determined period of time. It will not be immediately an undetermined period and faster aanstelling. In France, a term contract, which we call CDD, is only possible for a certain number of cases that are listed in French law. Most important are, for example, to replace an employee or seasonal activities or in some branches where it is a usual practice. The CDD has a lot of disadvantages as the French government and French uh, mentality as a whole is not in favor of it. So it is in most cases really much better to enter immediately into a CDE, which is a contract for undetermined period of time, but where the Trial periods are quite long and it sometimes may even be reconducted and where dismissals compared to the Netherlands are quite, uh, I wouldn't say easy, but um, easier. I go immediately there. Obviously, if uh, in order to terminate an agreement, an employee may resign himself or herself. This doesn't happen very often because in that case, employees in France will not be entitled to any unemployment monies. Therefore, the main ways to, dis to terminate agreements will be either the dismissals where the employer takes the initiative or the rupture conventionnelle where both parties may take initiative and which is somehow comparable to the fast stellings overeenkomst. However, the rupture conventionnelle can never contain a general waiver, which means that the employee and the employer only agree on the termination of the agreement, but that they may always, the employee may always come up with other claims later, such as you didn't pay me over time. In case of dismissal, the employer um, takes all kind of formal steps, but there is no need to ask for prior authorization from a judge or from the UVV, nor from the employee. Therefore, even if you don't have a solid file, you can still proceed to a termination of the labor agreement. But afterwards, the employee may claim damages. These damages will come up on top of the notice period and the normal dismissal premium. They may be quite high, but they were kept since September 2017. The claims the employee would file will be heard by the Conseil de Prudhomme, 
which is a lay court where two employers and two employees are sitting and where in my experience the point of view of the employees French employees often understood better than that of a foreign employer. However, it is also possible, obviously, to come to a settlement with the employee if there was um, to avoid those company, um, the, the proceedings in court. These are the very, very, very short uh, points I would like to stress today. I hope and I think there will be other further discussions about labor law later. And um, Really, it is uh, French labor law has the reputation of being very complicated, but in practice, if you follow the rules, it is very uh, good to handle it. And it also has, on some points, much easier ways of going than the Dutch law, for example, with employees who fall ill. But there is no time to discuss this now. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you uh, both of you for this short uh, legal masterclass and uh, of course you are open to questions that uh, can be uh, written in the uh, chat board. Um, let me now introduce Jean-François Chiron, uh, who will deliver us his testimonial on the Dutch company Ibusco that he is leading um, in France. Jean-François is a uh, a man of uh, urban public transport. Uh, he has been uh, managing uh, during his career different operational entities in uh, Veolia Transport in France and in the UK. And then uh, he was a member of the executive committee and uh, deputy uh, CEO of Transdev France uh, until uh, 2020 when he joined eBusco. So please, Jean-François, the stage is yours. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I will introduce quickly Ibusco. Ibusco, it's a Dutch company who design, build, and uh, distribute uh, electric buses in Europe. Uh, this is a young company. Uh, the company is about 10 years old founded by uh, Peter Biergeveld, and the company is in Dern. Uh, the, the company is uh, now it in seven, I'm sorry, um, yes, I have to, to move myself <laughs> the, the slides. Um, the, the company is, is now in seven countries in Europe. Uh, the company has about 5% of the market share of electric buses in Europe. Uh, last year, uh, the company uh, decided, and Peter Bichvel decided, to have a global rollout plan in, uh, in Europe. And they have decided, because uh, there is a lot of opportunity uh, right now for, for the zero emission in Europe, uh, uh, so you, you have a strong market uh, in front of us. He had decided to 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 come in Europe to have uh, to set up a company. Uh, we have set up the the subsidiary of Ibusco last November. This is a uh, SIS, and now we are looking to set up an industrial. Uh, factory to build in France uh, some buses. Uh, in Europe, in fact, if you, you want to sell some this kind of products, you need to be European. First of all, because you can get some subsidies. And uh, if you are not European, you can't uh, get these subsidies. And right now, there is a lot of opportunity with the recovery plan especially in France, but as well in, in Dutch land. So uh, we have uh, this, the, 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 the board of Ibusco have decided to have one factory in Poland for the north of, uh, of, uh, of Europe, one in France for, the, for the, the, the south of Europe, which is France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and perhaps it's not in the south perhaps UK, but it's not decided yet. So it depends 
of what we of the the industrial issues that we have to solve. The capacity of of the of the of the factory in France will be 500 bus per year. And why we can choose France and the the topic of the seminar is why to choose Paris. We, we will speak about it. But uh, France it's uh, in the south of Europe the biggest market for buses. There is about three, uh, 33,000 buses in operation in France. And uh, every year, uh, we are, there is about uh, 2,000 new buses coming. Uh, what's uh, the, fact, the factor in France should be? Uh, we're looking uh, to uh, 72,000 square meters to set up the factory, and we will create about 350 jobs. The, the global uh, schedule is to, 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 to have the first buses uh, built in France at the middle of 2023. So from now, we have two years to find the locations, to build the factory, to set up all the machine, and to start to produce in France. And if we come to the to the to the to the topic of the seminar, why to choose Paris and to choose France? First of all, uh, in France, we have a big legal support because after 2025, all the re renewal of the bus must be zero emissions. Right now, it's 50% from 20, 2021 to 2025, 50% must be zero emission. After 2025, 100% must be zero emissions. Um, there is, um, when I, I spoke with uh, the Dutch uh, ambassador, he said to, he said to us that uh, they are looking to have a new partners in Europe, and because uh, of because of the Brexit, and uh, they are looking to to have strong uh, relationship with France, which is as well uh, an opportunity for us to, to for this, this company to come in France. Uh, when I said previously, uh, the market is two thousand bus renewal per year. And we are looking to have about uh, 15 percent of this uh, of this uh, of this market, which is what reasonable. That means 300 buses per year, and the remaining 200 will be for the south, the other country. Uh, that means Spain, Portugal, and Italy. And uh, uh, what is quite sure, uh, why to come in front? It's as well if you want to sell buses in France, you. It's really better if you can build, if you can create the jobs in France because our business is B2G business. So with all the politics, they are looking uh, where, uh, where 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 you build where where you build your your products. And if it's uh, like right right now in China, it's not uh, very uh, it's not very good for the business. And what specifically we can choose Paris uh, as a, uh, not Paris, but the region in the France is because in fact there is there is really uh, uh, for the logistic point of view it's a perfect region. It's close to the Netherlands, and there is all the the facilities to go uh, in the in the in the south in the south of Europe as well. Uh, what is very important for us is uh, to to have access to, to the staff and uh, Paris regions. It's uh, perfect for that because there is a concentration of a lot of qualified people. And as well, uh, uh, there is uh, if we are in the Ile de France region, we have access to the RATP market and the 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 the, the, the Paris region is strongly committed for the zero emission and for the electric buses. For example, uh, I think that in the next five years, RATP 
uh, told that they will buy about 1,500 buses. So, very quickly, um, this is uh, the, the reasons where we are influenced and, where, and why we, we, we want to, to build a, a factory in France. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jean-Francois, um, for this testimonial. I think uh, it could uh, inspire a lot of other Dutch companies. And I think also that um, if you look at the reasons why to choose for Paris and for France, uh, especially, it's also very interesting, as you said, that uh, companies can conquer um, Southern Europe as uh, from France. So uh, I think that is uh, really an incentive for uh, Dutch MKBers. So thank you very much. Um, let's continue with um, the last part of our webinar from uh, Choose Paris. Um, I would like to present you Alain Pecheur, investment advisor for Choose Paris region, who speaks today on behalf of the global mobility team of Choose Paris. And that team helps a lot of companies each year to recruit locally their staff in Paris. Alain, the floor is yours. Thank you, Villemain. Thank you, uh, everyone, for attending uh, our webinar. And um, as an introductory note, I wanted to, um, uh, you, you certainly, as a manager, have experience um, challenges to recruit the staff that you needed to help your company grow. Um, in this presentation, I will introduce you to essential data that will uh, understand to uh, gain insight into the main aspect of the employment market of Paris region. We will then see the different sources where you can find talents. And finally, I will present you a government incentive that could be useful to balance your budget. So let's have a look at Paris region and see how it fares in respect to other cities in the world. If you take uh, a look at these figures, Paris region is leading in Europe for GDP, population, number of companies, and Fortune 500 headquarters. Paris is an outstanding uh, place for business opportunities and quality of life. Let's turn to the employment market. With 6.5 billion workers, of which 39% are aged 25 to 39, and 35% are holding at least a bachelor's degree, as you realize, Paris region is a pool of young, highly skilled talent. And therefore, it's quite easy to find a workforce, a qualified workforce that you're usually work looking for when you are setting up your business. In addition to that, Paris is characterized by a concentration of high growth industries, which attract highly skilled talent technology, finance, professional, scientific, and technical services. Paris region is known for strong innovation capabilities and business dynamism. And here on the map, you can see the breakdown of the main business hub in Paris region and where they are located. Now, let me give you some hints that will give you a picture of how to build your team here in Paris region. And first of all, in terms of remuneration, this grid reflects the average yearly wage in Paris and London per occupation. As you see, remuneration are comparatively the same, and that debunks the myth that Paris has a very high cost of employment compared to other cities. In terms of academic excellence and employability, Paris has a wide pool of highly skilled talents to recruit from. For instance, Paris has top-ranking multidisciplinary universities and top business schools. 
Paris is particularly attractive and you will find many graduates that are ready to stay in Paris region for their first work experience. And that also facilitates the, the way you can find talents. When it comes to building your team in Paris region, you, also, you will also find many adequate partners, public or private, who will facilitate the recruitment process. For instance, you have job boards, alumni and career departments, head hunters, and local district players that are all willing to help you recruit and source locally or internationally. And most importantly, Paris is a great place to build your work team because of its well-known cosmopolitan and expats welcoming. Moreover, Paris region offers 143 bilingual programs in 17 languages, enhancing cultural and educational di diversity. Of concern to you, Paris region has dense ties with the Dutch educational system. The NVTC Paris offers the opportunity to educate children from kindergarten to secondary schools. The renowned high school of Saint-Germain-en-Laye is offering a Dutch international section, which is the equivalent of VWO in the Netherlands. Then, as I mentioned in my introduction, I will now present you with a tax incentive that could help balance your budget when you move your activities to France. France is leading for research and development tax incentive. As you can see there, research and development expenses are benefiting from a 30% tax credit up to 100 million euro and 5% above that threshold. Jeune entreprises innovantes, or the other wise called startups, are exempted for eight years of social security contributions for eligible workers. And that's also a very good incentive to when you are starting your business here. And finally, the Dutch companies that are, as a matter of fact, 530 companies and 5,400 Dutch nationals are located in here. And they could be an anchor point that could help you launch your activities in terms of networking and business leads. I hope I've given you a good overview of how and why it's good to to um, come to Paris and build your team. We will send you the presentation I've just gone over and we look forward to hear from you. Thank you very much, Alain, for this uh, advice on recruiting in Paris region. Um, our webinar attendees uh, may now ask the, their questions. Uh, some of you have uh, already started and uh, written some questions in, in the board. So uh, there was one uh, from Eric Post um, asking on a practical level, training of users, mechanics, technical assistance, etc. How does your Dutch company communicate with its French clients? That was a question for uh, Ibusco. Um, how do you uh, avoid language barriers in everyday operation? So maybe uh, Jean-Francois, if you may uh, answer this question. Um, I Don't think forget to... is having a coffee. Uh, oh, all right. <laughs> let's uh -huh. uh, wait until he is back on screen. Um, For this one, okay. I have uh, I have a question for Miriam. In fact, uh, okay. You um, explained the difference between uh, different employment uh, contracts in France. And um, when you are uh, used uh, to working in a Dutch environment, uh, one of the questions that pops up in my head is the following, following. Would it not better to hire a consultant rather than, a, than an employee in France? I see what you mean. And a consultant being an independent person who is not having labor law protection. Yes. This is possible in France, like it is in the Netherlands. 
However, if the consultant, and this is also a bit like in the Netherlands, is working uh, a lot of his or her time for only one client, and more importantly even, if the, uh, the company that is having this contract with the consultant is giving instructions or is being too much um, involved in how and what and when the consultant is doing, the consultant may ask for the requalification of the contract into a labor agreement. Now, if the consultant is working through his or her company, this risk is a bit remoted, as the corporate will in France is a bit stronger than in the Netherlands. But it is obviously possible to have a consultancy agreement, but then it really should be a real consultant who has knowledge in his or her field and who is really doing the job independently. Okay, thank you, uh, Miriam. Welcome. There was also, also yes. a question on the form of company uh, that uh, would be recommended more than others. And Rita has uh, given an answer. Maybe you can speak it uh, loud. Yes, of course, it's difficult to say because it depends on the situation of everyone. But the SAS is a company that offers many flexibility, which means that almost the whole organization can be freely chosen by the shareholders that incorporate it. So in my experience at this moment, the most flexible form of company in France is the SAS and the one that is mostly chosen. Yes. Okay. So uh, Jean-Francois, uh, uh, nice having you back. Uh, there is a question for you uh, yeah. from Patrick Post. Uh, yeah. Did you hear it? So. Yeah, I saw, I saw the question. So uh, in fact, uh, it's, a, it's an issue. That's right. And in fact, I have to build a, a staff uh, for the staffing in France. I have to have only very bilingual people, English and French, because uh, it's very difficult in the in, in the in the operations to have some people uh, fluent in French, fluent in, in in English. So I have to build staff. All the staff must be speak English and French. Because we can, it's very easier to, to with the Dutch, as we said, office to 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 work in English. But uh, it's not easy to work in English in France, especially in operation. So that's an issue, and we we will tackle that. Just uh, I have to build uh, a, a staff with uh, with only people speaking English and French. Okay, thank you. Um, Pauline, are there any other questions? Well, I see another one for uh, Jean-Francois uh, about uh, advices. What would be the uh, top advices, maybe the two or three uh, advices that you would give to a Dutch company um, wanting to uh, start its business in uh, Paris region or France? It's difficult to give advice, but uh, uh, there is a, an interview from uh, uh, the, the, the president of Ibusco. Uh, he said uh, that uh, there is uh, it's a very different way of thinking between Dutch and French for the business. So I think that uh, to to to. to to be able to 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 succeed in France, uh, a Dutch company should have a, should have a, a French CEO. I think so, mm -hmm. uh, uh, or uh, somebody really fluent in French. In yes, fluent in French because it's difficult to to speak in uh, in English uh, on the with with a, with lot of people in France. Uh, I don't know. It's difficult to give uh, to give advice, but uh, I think that depends of what's your what what's your productions. Uh, but uh, in our case, because it's 
an, a big industry and we have the b2g business we it's really a big disadvantage if we don't produce in france if you in fact there is if you if you produce in france it's perfect if you produce in europe it's acceptable if you produce out of europe it's uh, too difficult to come in the market well, that's interesting, and uh, as you say, it's uh, probably linked also to the uh, uh, sector of activity uh, the company is in. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-François, for this advice. Um, uh, there was a last question on the average salary of a software engineer in France. Uh, maybe you could uh, just uh, write the answer, Alain, uh, while uh, Villemain sure. uh, uh, we'll conclude our webinar to uh, stay on time. Okay, yeah, um, so we managed to uh, stay uh, yeah, in time, uh, although our slight delay at the beginning. Um, thanks to uh, you all, uh, all, all the participants, and also to all the speakers uh, for, um, for being here today. Um, I would like to invite all the Dutch companies uh, present today uh, to download the Choose Paris handbook. So I have to go to the next slide to show it. Uh, yeah. The name is uh, Begin Hier, een stapsgewijze gids om je bedrijf te lanceren en te laten slagen in de regio Parijs. Um, the guide is as well in, uh, in English and in other languages, so uh, please do not hesitate to download it. Uh, you find some uh, uh, very interesting tips and tricks um, uh, to set up your business in Paris region. Well, thank you very much, Willemain. The link to download the guide is uh, on the chat, has been uh, posted on the uh, general chat. Thank you, everybody. If you have some further questions or if you are interested by our services, uh, you can contact Anouk or Alain, uh, which uh, phone numbers and emails are on this slide. And the presentation will be set uh, on our website. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks again. And we hope to see you soon. Bye bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Goodbye.